exclusive, uh, which means it is a uh, it's a hosted solution, and all you have to do is pay a flat monthly fee. And you can also add additional functionality through Shopify apps. So if there are you know certain functionalities that you can't get uh, natively in Shopify, they do have a a pretty decent pool of apps that will allow you to extend the functionality. Um, next, we're going to look at WordPress. Uh, so WordPress is a content management system from which you can build any type of website imaginable, including e-commerce sites. Um, now, the two websites that I showed previously, Laser Pegs and Pets on Socks, they're both WordPress sites. I personally prefer WordPress sites. Um, that's what I'm more comfortable in. Um, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more technical to set up than, than Shopify is. Shopify really does, you know, take you by the hand and walk you through the entire process. It was handcrafted uh, for, you know, uh, users who aren't that technically savvy or don't understand websites at all. Uh, it was built specifically for those types of people. Now, WordPress itself is free to use, but you still have to pay for hosting. Um, so if we look at the numbers, you know, Shopify, you're looking at a minimum of about $15 per month, um, for some business packages and get up to like 20, $25 per month for the basic ones with WordPress. Like I said, it's free. Um, you only have to pay for hosting and, and all the other things that every website needs, like a domain. Um, now with that, you can get hosting for about 80 bucks per year. So it actually, you know, kind of becomes a bit cheaper than Shopify, but then you also have to understand, you know, a little bit about website design in order to use WordPress. So um, sometimes WordPress is a little bit out of reach for the people who want to do it themselves. Uh, one of the nice things about WordPress is though, is that you can add so much additional functionality through free and, and paid plugins. Their plugin library is so massive just because of the fact that WordPress is open source, which means anybody can develop for that platform. So, you know, compared to Shopify's a couple hundred uh, apps, which they call, you know, they call plugins apps. Uh, WordPress, there's literally, you know, tens of thousands of plugins versus Shopify's a few hundred plugins. Now, some reasons that you should use Shopify over WordPress, right? So Shopify, like I said, it's much easier to set up and use than WordPress. There's not much of a learning curve. It holds your hand through the entire process. Uh, a lot of features which you have, uh, which you have to source separately in WordPress through plugins are available right out of the box with Shopify. Um, so notably, you know, there's a lot of uh, Shopify built themes that are for free. Um, you know, there's certain e-commerce features that are built in natively that you would have to try to find plugins for in, in WordPress. Uh, and payment gateway integration is extremely simple through Shopify. And again, you know, with WordPress, it's a little bit more technical. Uh, it needs a little bit of know-how to do it. Um, so it's just, it's much more uh, streamlined with Shopify. Hosting is included with the product. So again, it's an application. Uh, it's, a, it's a software as a service that you are paying monthly to use. Uh, with Shopify, you don't have to worry about the technical aspects of maintaining your site. If you use WordPress, you need to keep on top of this or your site will become vulnerable to being hacked. And what this is talking about are, are plugins. Um, so again, you know, WordPress, your website pretty much runs on plugins and WooCommerce, which is the e-commerce plugin for WordPress, you know, is itself a plugin. Um, and so if you do choose a WordPress site, you have to stay on top of all the plugins, make sure they're up to date um, because outdated plugins can become targets for uh, security breaches. So with Shopify, you don't have to deal with that at all. Uh, Shopify is largely responsible for the security of your website. You know, if you use WordPress, security depends on how diligent you are in up updating your software and theme. So again, with Shopify, you don't have to worry about doing technical updates, uh, whereas with WordPress, you do. Uh, Shopify has 24-7 support. You know, you can contact them by email, phone, or live chat. You know, by contrast, WordPress doesn't have support. You know, you may get support through your hosting provider, um, if not, then you're going to have to get the support from a WordPress developer or just a, a web developer who understands WordPress. 
Um, so again, you know, if you're a bit more technical savvy, then WordPress should be no problem. But, you know, for those where you don't want to have to sit down and learn how to build websites, you know, Shopify, again, is going to be uh, the best way to go. Now, for users who require an elegant but simple website delivered very quickly, again, Shopify is going to be your answer. Um, you know, I've been able to build full on e commerce websites in WordPress in about uh, 28 hours in total, I think, so about two days. Um, but then again, I've been using WordPress for about seven years. That's my preferred platform, and I know it like the back of my hand. Uh, GDPR compliance is a bit easier with Shopify compared to WordPress. Now, GDPR uh, is something that you have to take into consideration. And what that is, is it's essentially, it started over in the UK or Europe. Um, I can't remember which one specifically, uh, but if you go to a website and you get that pop-up that says, oh, you know, we, we use cookies on this site. Do you agree to use cookies? Do you decline? Um, that's part of the GDPR compliance. So if you plan on selling internationally to the UK and the Europe area, uh, you're going to want to make sure that your website is GDPR compliant. Now, you don't necessarily have to worry about this if you're not selling to um, internationally, if you're only selling within the US, uh, but it's a good idea to at least have that uh, ability to, to become GDPR compliant. And the nice thing about Shopify is you can easily try the product out for free. With WordPress, it's a lot more technical to, to set it up for free. You know, you have to learn how to install a virtual server software onto your computer and then install WordPress through that. Um, so that's what we call like a local dev site. Uh, it's a bit, it's, 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 it's out of the scope of this uh, presentation, but there is a way to, to use WordPress for free. But again, you have to be a web developer. You have to know what you're doing uh, in order to test it out. So, you know, Shopify seems like the clear answer to everything, but yet, you know, I, why would I use WordPress instead of Shopify? Well, like I said before, it's completely open source, which means it's free and anybody can develop on that platform. So, it, you know, there's such a wide range of functionality that you can get on the website. You can build any type of site on WordPress. It's much more flexible and open than Shopify is. Uh, when we're talking about themes and templates, there's so much more uh, of a wider range available in WordPress than there are in Shopify. Uh, WordPress comes with a more sophisticated content management system, which unlike Shopify facilitates content versioning and archiving. So this is very important as your website grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you know, like I said before, uh, WordPress has a vast range of plugins. They're both paid for and free um, that are available to help you add functionality to your, to your site. You know, you can also add functionality to Shop, uh, Shopify sites via the Shopify apps, but there's a much more limited range to choose from. Now with WordPress plugins, the common theme is a freemium uh, paid method. So what they'll do is, you know, you can definitely find plugins um, that can do everything that you need. Um, and you can download it, install it, use it for free. But then there are other features in that plugin that if you wanted to use, you'd have to pay for it. So many times I can get away with building a, web, a WordPress website without having to pay for any of those plugins. Um, but sometimes you do need some of that extra functionality. Uh, you have a much greater range of options when it comes to e-commerce in WordPress than in Shopify. Again, because WordPress is a platform, there are multiple different e-commerce uh, variations that you can install. Uh, I personally prefer WooCommerce. That's sort of the, the main supported e-commerce platform. Um, but there are a few other ones out there. With Shopify, it's just sort of, you know, what you see is what you get. And you have to, uh, you know, use uh, what's available to you within the Shopify platform. Uh, the number of variants and product options that you can use without an app or without a plugin uh, in Shopify is a bit limited, but many of the WordPress options give us much more flexibility with that. So again, you know, the common theme here is that Shopify is very sort of set in stone with what you can do. It's kind of restrictive, but it's super simple to use. WordPress is much more open. It's extremely flexible, but it's harder to use. Uh, one of the big reasons why I use WordPress over any other type of CMS or any other type of e-commerce platform is because SEO, search engine optimization, 
in WordPress is so much better than in any other platform. And the reason for this, again, is because of the plugins that we can install. Uh, the big one being Yoast SEO. Another one that I like to use is called Rank Math. Um, you know, search engine optimization is what's going to generate uh, long-term success for your business. So this is an extremely crucial part um, to making your decision on which e-commerce platform you want to uh, you want to use. Now, on a WordPress website, you have much more control over your content. Uh, with Shopify, you have to adhere to an acceptable, uh, acceptable use policy, and you may have trouble exporting some of your site content. Um, so if you're going to be using the Shopify platform, there are certain products you cannot sell on it. Um, you know, now, I don't think anybody's ever going to run into that issue. Um, but, you know, because you are using their software, their service, uh, you are confined to only doing what they let you do. Again, with WordPress, it's completely free and open to use however you wish. Uh, you can export pages and posts more easily in WordPress. So, again, this is um, exporting data from the website. Much easier to do in WordPress. Uh, if you plan on creating a multilingual site, so if you know that your target demographic is going to be, you know, 50-50 English to Spanish speakers, then you want to make sure that your website is compatible with multilingual plugins that will, let's say, auto-translate the web page for you, or, um, you know, you have a separate site for that uh, language. You know, that's so much easier to, to build into WordPress than it is with Shopify. In fact, I don't even think you can do that with Shopify. Um, and the product, you know, WordPress itself has a much longer history and a significantly bigger user base than Shopify. So if we're looking at uh, websites that use a CMS system, um, so it's not built from scratch, but it uses something like WordPress or Shopify, WordPress actually makes up over 70% of that market share. So it is huge. A lot of people use it. It's been around for a lot longer. Um, you know, Shopify is a bit newer. Uh, it's, but it's, it's specifically made for e-commerce. So then, you know, just to try and cram all of that down into a single question, which one should you use? Um, choose Shopify if you need just a basic platform to sell your stuff on and you plan on doing everything yourself. You know, if that sounds like you, choose Shopify. Um, but if you want a lot more flexibility and control over your website, you want to get serious about a long-term strategy for your online store, you have a budget to potentially hire a professional to build the website, you know, then WordPress is going to be the answer. So uh, again, if you're just starting out, you don't really have a budget, you're just trying to sell some stuff to get some cash flow going, you Shopify. Um, but the, the goal is going to be to get to WordPress so that you can engage in digital marketing campaigns to drive even more traffic to your site. So with all of that being said, uh, like I said, we're going to jump into how to set up your Shopify store because I feel that's what the majority, if not everybody, uh, it would fit into that category. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and I'm just going to walk through the entire process of setting up the store. So with Shopify setup, you know, you just start off by going to Shopify.com. You're going to click on one of those green buttons that says start free trial. Uh, and then you're going to type in your email address, your password, and then your store name. So the store name is essentially going to be what your, your, your company's name is, your brand name, right? Uh, from there, it's going to take you through a couple more forms. Now, the first one here, like, are you already selling? This is an internal analytics just for them. It doesn't really have, you know, any relevance to you. Um, but they like to collect this data about their users so that they can put their statistics together. Same thing with your current revenue. They want to know how much you're making so that they can see, okay, what, you know, what kind of customer is this going to be on our platform? Uh, the which industry will you be operating in? Again, this is more of an internal metric for themselves, but it also helps. Um, they'll try to, uh, when you go to add a new theme to your website, they'll show you themes that are relevant to the industry that you select. So it kind of helps to tape, uh, tailor your experience a little bit. Uh, and then the second form is just an address. Now, this address is important. Uh, if you don't have a physical business address, you can use your home address. Um, but uh, it's important to, to know that this address is going to be the base of your, of your website. So when we start to calculate things like tax and shipping, it's going to be using this address to calculate uh, those expenses. So you want to make sure that you do this correctly and you don't put in a fake address. 
So after you fill out those, it's going to take you to a dashboard that looks like this. And uh, from your dashboard, you know, you can view things like your products, you can view your orders, uh, you can view your customers, analytics, all sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, it's really going to be the central hub of your uh, Shopify experience. Uh, and the nice thing about Shopify, like I said, is that it literally takes you by the hand and walks you through the whole process. So when you go to your dashboard, you know, it pops up with this screen and says, hey, you know, add your first product. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to click on that button right there, and it's going to take us to a page where we can add our first product. <clears throat> now, this seems kind of self-explanatory, but I'm going to walk through each one. Uh, the title is the name of your product. Uh, description. Uh, right, you know, this is just a description of your product. Again, very self-explanatory. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about SEO when we get further into the, the presentation, but uh, that's where we're going to do a lot of the optimization work for SEO is in the description there. And for the media section, you want to upload all of the pictures that you have for, uh, for your product. Um, I believe you can also add videos here if you want. And then from there, once you add those images, you'll be able to select which one you want as the featured image. And then the rest will get put into an image gallery that uh, users can scroll through. Next, we're going to set up the pricing for your product. So the price is what you are selling the product for. Uh, on the right of that, we're going to see compare at price. So if you want to set your product at a uh, on sale, if you want to set it at a discount or something, so let's say uh, MSRP is $100, um, but you want to put it on sale for 10% off. So the compare at price is going to be the original price. And then just price is going to be the price that you're actually selling it for. So if, like I said, if we were at uh, $100, so we would put 100 over here, and then we would put $90 over here. And so what that'll do is when someone sees that product, it'll show, oh, the original price is 100, it'll be um, slashed out, and then it'll have the sale price underneath it. Uh, the cost per item, that this is for your own internal analytics. Uh, so if you know how much the item costs to manufacture, or if you're reselling an item, how much does that item cost you to purchase? You can put that cost per item in there uh, and it'll automatically figure out what your margin is and how much profit you're making uh, per sale. If you need to collect tax on a, on a particular product, then you want to go ahead and make sure that that uh, checkbox is selected. Now, just to be on the safe side, I recommend everybody collect sales tax. Um, from what I, and this is not legal advice by any means, but just you know, from what I remember a few years ago reading, is that if you don't have a physical location in, in that state, you don't have to collect sales tax. Um, but just to be on the safe side, I would still collect tax just in case. It's better to be safe than sorry. Um, next is the inventory management for your product. So a SKU is stock keeping unit. This is a unique identifying number for a product. Um, this, you don't have to put a SKU in. However, uh, it's it's highly recommended that you do, again, for organizational reasons. Also, if you use any type of inventory management systems, um, they require SKUs uh, just so that you know what, you know, what product is what. Um, if you have a barcode for it, for instance, you know, if you sell your, your items physically um, or in other stores, usually they require a barcode. So you can put the barcode number in there as well. Um, if you have a set amount of stock, you can track the quantity so that once that stock reaches zero, the product automatically goes out of stock and nobody can purchase that, uh, that item until you set more in stock. Um, so it's a good, it's a good way to kind of, uh, keep from getting back orders if you don't want back orders. Um, you know, there's been a couple of times where I've forgotten to do this and we'd get a few, you know, a few sales in and it's like, uh oh, you know, we're out, you know, and you have to sit there and you have to write an email to the customer explaining, oops, we just went out of stock and it gets a bit, uh, you know, it gets a bit weird and, and sometimes you have to refund the customer. And so, you know, you're just losing money at that point because you have to pay for transaction fees and everything. And so uh, if you have a set amount of inventory, make sure that you set the quantity in there and that you track the quantity. 
Um, otherwise, if it's a product that's like made on demand, uh, you don't really have to worry about uh, tracking the stock. Uh, next, we're going to set up the shipping. So shipping, if you're actually going to be shipping a physical product, then we have to, you know, you're definitely going to want to put the weight in there. If it's, if you're selling a digital or downloadable type product, you don't have to worry about this section. But if you are selling a physical good that you have to ship to a customer, uh, make sure that the box is checked and then you actually weigh the product. Uh, it's extremely important that you get the weight correct because again, uh, it's gonna use this weight in order to calculate the shipping cost for that item. Now, if you are shipping internationally, uh, you will have to fill out the second bit of this section. So setting your uh, country or region of origin. So if your uh, store is based in the US, you would just put US. Um, and then uh, you're gonna have to search for the HS code for whatever uh, category your product kind of fits into. Um, so if you don't know what that is, you know, I would go on to Google to try and figure that out. Otherwise, you can just use their search system. It's pretty intuitive and you should be able to find one uh, with ease. Uh, and the last part to uh, adding products to your site are different variants. Now, a variant is a product that has more than one um, different variations. So for instance, if you're selling a shirt, you know, maybe, you know, one option would be sizes and then you would type in all of the sizes that you want to offer. So in this case, we have small, medium, large. Uh, and then the second option, well, we also offer, you know, all of them in different colors. So we've got red, black, yellow, and blue. Now, the nice thing about Shopify is that it'll automatically take your options with all of the different variations and it'll create all of the different variations of that product. So again, we've got, you know, all of the small, uh, all the small shirts with all the color combinations, all the medium with color combinations and all the large with combinations. So with the pricing here, if you leave it blank, it's going to retain the price that we put up above. But let's say, again, for shirts, sure, usually, you know, if you get into like the 2XL, 3XL, uh, those have an additional cost. You know, it's usually like $2, $3 uh, as you continue to go up from uh, XXL. So if you have, you know, if one of the variations is a, is a different price, then you can set that price here. You can set individual uh, stock quantities right there. And then if each individual variation has its own SKU, uh, you can type it in there. Uh, and then what I would do is repeat, you know, save the product and then repeat this until you've got all of your products uploaded. Now, one of the downsides to Shopify is that I don't think it has a bulk upload uh, or bulk import option. So I don't believe that there is a way to import uh, tons of products if you have like a CSV file or, or, or a spreadsheet. Again, that's one of the reasons I like WordPress is because WordPress has a built-in bulk importer. So all you have to do is upload a CSV or an Excel file and it'll upload all of those products to your site. So it makes it a bit easier, especially for much larger uh, businesses. So next we're gonna look at editing the visuals of your website, editing the layout and the design and everything. So a theme is a template that determines the way your online store looks and feels. Different themes have different styles and layouts and offer a different experience for your customers. For example, you know, if you're selling spa products, then you probably want your online store to feel relaxed and luxurious. Whereas, you know, if you're selling electronics, you might want it to be, you know, high, ener ener high energy, you want it to be sleek. Um, so when you're browsing through the themes, you want to try and find one that's that fits your branding, that fits, you know, your, your, your message and how you want people to feel on your website. So, uh, and that's actually the next step in the process that Shopify walks you through. Once you've added your first product, um, you can continue to add more products or it'll take you to the next step, which is choosing your theme. Um, so from here, you know, this is, uh, if you wanna try and find this again on the left-hand side, uh, we have the, 
you know, your sort of dashboard tabs. And then if you click on your online store, it'll bring up some sub tabs and that's where the themes lives. So this will show right off the bat that, hey, our store is password protected. This means that we're, uh, we're, it's in development and that the only way somebody can view the website is if they have a password that you set. So it allows you again to just kind of build the website without having um, the potential of somebody coming to the website and making a purchase while you're still working on it. Uh, so it'll show you what your current theme is. And from here, you can customize the theme that you've got active. If you scroll down on that page, uh, it'll show you the theme library. So you can actually go into there and you can explore the free themes or you can explore some premium themes made by other um, authors other than Shopify. Um, and so again, you know, go through there, find a theme that really speaks to you, find a theme that fits your products and your branding, um, and then you can uh, activate that. Now, again, sometimes, there, there are premium themes that you have to pay for, uh, but honestly, if you can find a free theme that works for you, go for it. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at what customizing the theme looks like. So in this instance, we're editing the home page, and this is what the default home page looks like with the default um, theme. So the left-hand side is gonna be your layout hierarchy with all of the different elements of your web page. On the right hand side, that's the actual visual editor. It shows you what your website is going to look like. Um, now, what's nice about uh, Shopify is that it's literally uh, drag and drop, you know? Um, so you can see on the left, we have all of the elements of the page. And then at the very bottom, it says add section. So we can add more stuff. We can drag those items up and down to rearrange the sections. It's a very intuitive builder, uh, very, very user friendly. And then when you want to change the page that you want to edit, there's the drop down at the top of the page. If you click on that, it'll drop down and then you can change another page template that you can edit. Um, when it comes to actually adding new pages and building those pages, um, I'm going to take a step back real quick. And again, uh, on that left hand side menu, uh, there uh, underneath the themes tab where we're at now, you've got blog posts. So that's where you would insert your blog posts and then pages underneath that. That's where you would actually go to add more pages for your website and to build out those pages. Uh, but again, it's gonna look something very similar like this. Uh, it's a very intuitive uh, drag and drop builder. So once you've gone through that entire process, you've kind of just tweaked everything, you've designed it the way that you wanted to design it. The next thing is to add a custom domain. So by default, when you sign up for a Shopify account, your domain is going to be like your store name dot my Shopify dot com. Now you don't want to be marketing that URL to everybody because that just doesn't look professional, right? You want to have a custom domain. So it would be just your store dot com. Um, now the nice thing about Shopify again is that it will walk you through the entire process of purchasing your own domain. Uh, all you have to do is click on the green add domain button and then you just follow the process. Now, if you already have a domain from another provider, uh, it's a little bit more technical in order to point that domain over to Shopify. What I would suggest is uh, contacting Shopify support and they'll walk you through the whole process of pointing your domain that you already have to your Shopify uh, account. And then the last thing that you're gonna do is set up payments. So once you set up payments, your website is essentially fully functioning and you can start marketing it, right? So there's several different payment gateways that you can use for the uh, for your e-commerce site. If you've never used a payment gateway before, you don't know what a payment gateway is, you're just setting up an e-commerce store for the first time. Um, the, the Shopify payments integration it, by default, you know, it's it's perfectly fine to use. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're just going to click on the green button and uh, complete the account setup. Once you complete the account setup, uh, you'll be able to accept payments and then that money uh, will start going into your bank account once you start making sales. Uh, some other options that you can use are things like PayPal or Amazon Pay. Um, however, if you already have a payment gateway or payment processor, so let's say, uh, for instance, you know, you have a physical store, you already use Square 
uh, that you've got the card reader, you've got a Square account, you've got your inventory set up in Square. Um, so you can scroll down a little bit and you can go to the third party provider section. Uh, and if you choose the third uh, third party provider, it brings up a list with a search bar. All you have to do is search for uh, Square uh, or whatever payment gateway you pr uh, currently use. And then you can install that, activate it, and then you just have to log in with your account and Shopify will automatically integrate it and sync it with your website. Um, so that is pretty much how you set up your, your Shopify store to start selling. Um, so we've, we've got all the products up there. We've tweaked the design a bit to make it look more uh, pleasing. The, the theme fits our products and our branding. We can accept payments for, our, uh, you know, for all of our sales. Now we need to start driving traffic to the website so we can actually generate some sales. Um, so that's going to be the final section today. It's going to be marketing your products you know, and how to start generating those sales. Now, something that I talked about a couple of weeks ago, and Jack also talked about this, was creating a customer avatar or a buyer persona, right? So it's basically creating your ideal customer. Who are you trying to sell to? And when you're, when you're thinking about this, you want to try to be as in-depth as possible. You are crafting like an entire person. Think of it as like, um, like a tabletop game where you're trying to create a, a character with a full backstory and, and, a, and a history and everything. You know, you, uh, the more in-depth that you can be about creating a, ca a customer avatar, the more successful you're going to be in actually marketing your products. So you want to think about things like their demographics, you know, how old are they? What is their gender? Where do they live? What is their income levels? Um, and then their psychographics. So how do they, what are their interests and how do they behave? You know, what are their buying habits? What I like to do is I like to use this worksheet to create my customer avatars. Now, you're going to have multiple worksheets filled out with all different types of people. And again, the more people and more uh, avatars that you can create, the more in-depth that you can be with these avatars, again, the more successful you're going to be. So it's really important to actually take the time to figure out who you're trying to sell to. So. Once we've created our customer avatars, the first place we're going to start marketing is social media. You know, so social media marketing allows you to push your products in front of your ideal customers. Using your customer avatars, you can create target audiences inside of Facebook to hone in on the people most likely to purchase your products. So when you create a post or if you want to create an advertisement and you want to, you know, you want to push that ad out to people or if you want to boost a post, one of the options that you have is to select a target audience. And so this is where we're actually going to put in all of our customer avatars. So we're going to be creating one audience per avatar. And I'm going to walk you through the process on how to create these audiences um, so that you can do it on your own. Now, the nice thing about this is that if you, by creating just one audience per customer avatar, you can target multiple audiences per boosted post or per ad, but by segmenting it out into multiple audiences, you actually get to see which audiences perform better. And then you can try to do some investigative analytical work to figure out, well, why does that, uh, you know, target audience perform much better than other target audiences? Why is this avatar performing better than my other avatars? Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do some basic demographics, right? So we're going to look at where they live, how old are they, what is their gender? And then we want to get a little bit more detailed into their target demographics so we can click on the browse button under the detailed targeting. So what that does is it pulls up all of the demographic information that Facebook holds. Right. So again, we can get into what languages they speak, what's their relationship status, are they married, are they single, um, what education level do they have? Maybe your, your products are targeted to you know, uh, college grads or, or uh, people in grad school. You know, uh, do they have children? You know, are they parents? Do you sell kids toys? You know, and you're trying to target people who have kids. Um, you know, so, you, so going through here and really going in and, and honing in on you know, who your prime demographic is, adding all these little details, it's just gonna help you really target 
your your prime demographic. Uh, another thing, life events. So let's say you know if you sell a product that does really well, or it's, it's it's specific to like anniversaries or something. You can go into life events and you can actually select people who are going to have an anniversary soon, or somebody who who's friends with somebody who's about to have an anniversary soon. Um, so again, it, it's a great way to really hone in very specifically on people that will match best with your product. Uh, and then next, we're going to look at the psychographics. So again, this is the their interests and how they behave, right? So interests, you know, what do they like? What forms of entertainment do they like? What are their hobbies? Uh, who are your competitors? You know, think about who your competitors are. Because if they've got a Facebook page, you can actually target people who show an interest in your direct competitors. So if, if somebody is interested in one of your direct competitors, then, hey, they would be interested in my products as well. So you can target those people um, to, again, really hone in on a very specific set of, of uh, individuals. So with these, you know, you can target people within certain industries and certain businesses. Uh, you can target people based on their entertainment, what type of music they like, what, what type of movies they like. Uh, if they're into fitness, you know, if you sell fitness products right here, there's a whole section dedicated to fitness and wellness, uh, food and drink, hobbies and activities, shopping and fashion. Right. So there's a ton of different interests that we can go in there. Uh, and we can toggle on or off uh, to, to try and hone in on that target audience. And then another thing that I like to do is look at behaviors, especially for e-commerce stores. You want people who are actively buying products from Facebook ads, right? That's kind of like the crown jewel right there. If you can target people who are actively, you know, clicking on, on Facebook ads and have a history of, of purchasing from the, uh, from a website, you know, that, that is extremely valuable because that allows you to target people who are actively buying, right? So <clears throat> that goes into the purchase behavior. So uh, inside of the behaviors, if you come down here to purchase behavior, uh, you can actually select people and, and target people who are actively buying uh, through Facebook. Uh, another way that you can target people is by travel. You know, if you sell, uh, items that are specific to travel for instance you know one of my clients that i have um it provides covid test kits for people and uh one of the ways that we targeted people were by their travel uh, habits so people who travel a lot for work people who uh, are here on vacation or people who plan to to come here on vacation uh you know we targeted those people uh just through the uh through the travel section down here so we were able to travel uh, or we were able to target travelers um, and sell them COVID test kits. Uh, now, fine tuning this bit's uh, a little bit more advanced. You don't have to really um, deal with any of this, but just to kind of tell you what it is, uh, you know, this if we look at the exclude and the narrow audience buttons at the bottom, uh, the exclude button allows you to set a target demographic you definitely don't want to show your ads or your posts to, right? So even if they fit anything in the detailed targeting, if they fit one item in the exclude, it will not show it to that person. Uh, on the contrary, narrow audience means, you know, if they fit something in your detailed targeting and they fit something um, in, in your narrow audience targeting, then it'll show the ad. So it gets super, super, super defined. Um, it's not ideal to do this. This is a much more advanced feature, but you know, um, it's always nice to know sort of what, what those are for. And then once you've completed your audience, it'll give you an insight into, okay, how many people can you reach with this? Uh, you know, and if you set a budget, you know, how much, you know, how many clicks are you gonna get out of it every day? Uh, what is your potential daily reach for this? And then at the top there is your total reach. How many people are actually in your defined audience? Uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about search engine optimization. Again, this is one of those things I went super in depth with a few weeks ago. If you want to watch that to learn how to actually optimize your website, uh, you can go on to the Minnesota.score.org website and rewatch that workshop. Um, but I am going to go over it a little bit and kind of explain how it works with e-commerce websites. 
So search engine optimization accounts for 50% of all website traffic. You know, SEO is what's going to generate the majority of your business uh, eventually, though. You know, the downside to SEO is that it takes anywhere from six to eight months to start seeing results from it. And that's because SEO is based on thousands of algorithms. You know, it takes time for Google to understand your site, see the optimizations that have been made to it, and also determine how trustworthy that information is on your site. You know, so for those of you who are familiar with Google, which should probably be everybody, um, this is what a Google results page looks like. And we call these the SERPs, the search engine results page. Now, SEO helps you rank organically, right? And the organic listings are listed below the ads, below Google My Business, the little map pack, um, you know, but the thing is, is that 70% of users actually skip over the ads and everything. They go directly to these organic listings. And that's why it's super important to have an, a, an SEO campaign, or at least to think about having an SEO campaign. Because again, SEO is what's going to determine the long-term success of your business. You know, sure, advertising is going to get you the, the business up front, but it's expensive, right? With SEO, you know, if you can start generating organic sales to the point where you don't have to pay for an advertising campaign, you're going to end up saving yourself a ton of money in the long run. So SEO, SEO is definitely extremely important. And there's three different uh, main pillars to SEO, right? You've got your technical SEO, you've got your on-page SEO, and you've got your off-page SEO, also known as authority building. So technical SEO, to sum all of this up, it's all of the coding and the structure of your website. With Shopify, what's nice is that they have very simplistic SEO tools to help you rank your website organically. They're not as good as WordPress. Uh, they're, they're quite primitive compared to WordPress, but they still do their job well enough, right? Like I said before, if you really want to get, if you can get to a point where you want to get serious about the long-term success of the site and really grow the site, uh, you do want to move on to WordPress. It's going to be so much easier and more effective. But like I said, Shopify does have some basic SEO tools that will allow your website and your products to rank. Um, the nice thing with Shopify too is that you really don't have to worry too much about the technical stuff. On-page SEO is going to be optimizing the content of the site. This is the only part that differs from normal SEO, uh, between normal SEO and e-commerce SEO, is that you know with normal SEO, usually you're trying to optimize um, pages of services. You know, you're trying to get service pages to rank, whereas with e-commerce, we're trying to get our products to rank. And the way that we do that is to try and figure out what people are actually searching for in search engines to find the products that we're selling. And so you would use that keyword to then optimize your product page uh, for that keyword. And if we go, if you remember back, or I said in the description where we're setting up our, pro, uh, our products, we're adding our products, you know, that description box, that's where we're going to write all of the content. So when we do the on-page SEO, we wanna make sure that that content that we put in the description is, um, it's optimized for the keywords that people are actually using to try and find that product. And then the off-page SEO, uh, it's, it's very uh, complex to think about, but the easiest way I've found to, um, you know, to, to, to describe this is through the analogy of, you know, if, if I've got a toothache, you know, I need to find a dentist, right? So I'm gonna go to a few different people to try and get a dentist recommendation. Right now, if they all give me the same business card, then I know that that dentist does pretty good work. They're trustworthy, right? So I'm going to go to that dentist. And it's the exact same thing with search engines and websites, right? Somebody's coming to a search engine to find a solution to their problem, you know, because that's essentially what people do on a search engine, right? They ask a question. Uh, and so Google uh, is trying to answer that question. So if Google notices, and again, this is one of the reasons why SEO takes a long time because Google has to find all of these dots and connect them um, over time. But you know, if Google sees that a lot of websites are referring their traffic to your website, um, just like other people were referring that dentist to me, you know, Google will, will, will think that's a pretty powerful website if everyone's sending their traffic to it. 
right? So that's how you build up that authority. And you do that through getting backlinks. So those referrals are called backlinks. The only way to get those is through like guest blog post services. Uh, it's a it's a paid service. Uh, it's it's definitely a pain to deal with, but it is a necessary evil when trying to build up the authority of your site. The importance of the authority too is that it very heavily uh, determines how well you rank. So if your website is brand new, it doesn't have any authority. It's going to be kind of difficult to rank for uh, keywords. Whereas you know if you've got a higher authority it's going to be a lot easier to rank and it's going to be a lot easier to rank for brand new keywords. And then the last thing that I want to talk about when it comes to marketing your products is through email marketing. And this is going to be an extremely powerful tool for you, especially for e-commerce websites. Uh, and there's two ways that we can maximize our email marketing, right? We can create lead magnets uh, to try and attract uh, email addresses. And we can use emails for retargeted marketing. So lead magnets, you know, they're, they're like little freebies that you can offer on your website. Whether it's a newsletter sign up form or a free download that requires an email entry in order to access. Or if it's like a little pop up when somebody visits the website, like, hey, sign up for our newsletter and get 10% off your first purchase or something like that. You know, it's a little freebie that you're trying to give to the customer uh, in order to acquire their email address. Right. So these gathered emails can then be put into a marketing platform like MailChimp or Constant Contact so that you can target them based on how you got their emails. Um, you know, and this is a great way to create a sales funnel that pushes a visitor that was kind of interested in a product but didn't really do much. You know, you can push them into becoming a paying customer by putting them into a marketing an email marketing campaign and pushing them through that sales funnel. And then the last thing is through retargeted marketing, you know, and that allows you to create repeat customers. Uh, and this is usually done by sending out emails to current or past customers about special promotions. If you've got like a holiday sale going on, uh, if you've got new products coming out, you know, you give them a reason to come back to your website time and time again. You know, you can also keep them up to date with the latest news about your company if they signed up for the newsletter. Um, one of the most powerful email marketing techniques for e-commerce websites is called abandoned cart emails. Uh, abandoned cart email, what that means is let's say somebody added a product to their cart, they started the checkout process, they, and the only way that this works is if they typed in their email address during the process, otherwise it doesn't know who to send the email to. But if you have abandoned cart emails enabled, and which is one of the built-in features of Shopify, you just have to make sure that it's enabled in your settings. Um, with WordPress, you have to install an external plugin in order to get that functionality. But again, what that does is if somebody adds a product to your cart, uh, they start the checkout process, but they never finish, right? That cart sits there for a certain amount of time. I believe you get to set the amount of time before it's uh, considered abandoned. Uh, what will happen is, let's say an hour after the cart's abandoned, your website will automatically shoot them an email and be like, hey, you know, the, these items are getting kind of lonely in your cart. Come back and save 10%, you know, if you finish your checkout. Um, those abandoned cart emails are so powerful because they, you know, they're free to do. It's completely automated. And yet you can increase the amount of conversions that you're getting just by enabling that. Now, on the on the on the flip side, you want to make sure that you don't send too many abandoned cart emails because people will get very frustrated with you, especially, you know, if they they you know like ah, I really don't want this product. You know, they get one email from you like, hey, you know, your stuff is still waiting for you. That's okay. But then if you start sending, you know, one at one hour, one at six hours, one the next day, one the day after that, that's just way too much you'll end up you know uh, potentially being uh, considered as a spam sender so just one one to two follow-up emails letting them know hey you know your cart's been abandoned but hey your products are still here come back finish your checkout um, here's even a 10 percent coupon or something in order to try and facilitate and to incentivize them to complete the checkout um, so with that, you know, that pretty much wraps up our e-commerce workshop for today. Uh, we're going to spend the next seven or so minutes um, answering any questions that you might have. Uh, you know, I would love to try and get more into detail, but again, we only had an hour to do this. So if you do have some questions, now's the time to ask them, um, or you can reach out to us at any time uh, to get some more information. 
such great uh, content, Jeremy. Thank you so much for, for giving us all this information. Um, this is a really great question from Lourdes. I am a service provider. Does Shopify, do you think that would benefit her? Um, she has products too, books and courses. What would you recommend? So Shopify is an e-commerce specific platform. If you want to you know, build your website on Shopify, you definitely can. Uh, if you, you know, like if you provide services, you can create pages for your services. Um, and then if you want people to pay for those services online, they can sort of purchase it. You know, you can create a product for that service and they can purchase it online, do it that way. Um, with service-based industries though, I recommend if you're trying to go the DIY route, you know, I would recommend something more like Squarespace or Wix, uh, Webflow, one of those. Uh, if you're at the stage where you're ready to, you know, deploy a digital marketing campaign, you're ready to start generating some people to your website, then I would highly recommend WordPress because WordPress can scale with your business. Um, but if you're primarily a service provider that also sells products, um, uh, you, you can use Shopify. Um, so if, if, you know, if you only do services, uh, I wouldn't recommend Shopify because again, Shopify is primarily an e-commerce. Um, but if you also sell products and you don't want the hassle of trying to figure out WordPress, uh, then Shopify should still work for you. Great, Jeremy. And um, we've launched the poll there. If you folks would just take a minute and respond to the poll, you know, this helps us in understanding um, where you're at in the business process and how we can format um, these workshops to best help you. Uh, we do want to thank you for coming today. Uh, don't forget to click on the survey. We got a couple more questions here that I'll run through. Um, she said she does, uh, Laura's just responding, thanks, and she does have WordPress. Okay, so, perfect, yep. I would stick yeah. with WordPress um, because, you know, WordPress is pretty much the uh the final stop for your website you know and over the years you're going to want to update the website you know there's new design trends that come in about three to five years just make sure you keep your website up to date with those um but absolutely you know when when trying to grow a business online wordpress is going to be you know the, the be all end all of the platform that you should use you know shopify wix squarespace those are kind of your introductory level websites for the the do-it-yourselves um, but when it actually comes time to growing it and getting serious about growing it, then WordPress is going to be where it's at. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeremy. So appreciate your insight and advice. People, um, you know, if you have questions for Jeremy, feel free to reach out for us. Uh, we're happy to help you. And if you need a mentor for your business, you know, reach out to SCORE Minnesota. We love to help small businesses in the area whether you're growing your business or just starting a business, maybe you're retooling because of all the changes that have happened. We're here to help you. So we're, we're happy to do that. Hope you all have a fantastic week and we look forward to seeing you next week in the next part of our series. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Paula.